thanks everybody for coming back after the great session this morning about variational methods and other things. Um, I'm going to hopefully talk you through the second half of a three hour lecture about quantum field theory in and of itself and how it relates to quantum computing and then how you actually compute things on a quantum computer. Uh, I will say that Dorota did a really great job uh, with their lectures a couple days ago, setting up a pretty good pedagogical introduction to how lattice field theory works. And I'm going to unfortunately disappoint you by both not using the whiteboard very much and also going a lot quicker and not as much calculate calculations are going to be talked about and sort of just give you sort of an impressionistic view of the kinds of things that if you're doing high energy physics or you're doing condensed matter physics that you think about when you're trying to work in the space of quantum computing. So having said all of that, um, I need to put this disclaimer out up front, which is that you know both the problems and the solutions in terms of this space of high energy physics and field theory and quantum computing that I'm going to talk about today are sort of the ones that I think are important to emphasize because they're the ones that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and that sort of in our field we've agreed are kind of big deals. And certainly the solutions are going to be my own uh, and sort of my opinions on what the good ones might be. Um, sort of the reason that we started out with the lecture on Monday talking about lattice field theory is that there is a sort of sense in the high energy physics community at least that you know if it ain't broke don't fix it and if for those of you that are in the know lattice field theory is sort of the only systematically improvable way to give us access to non perturbative field theory. And so this is you know this big sort of push that if we're going to do quantum computing for field theory, we probably should stick as closely to lattice field theory as we can, and so that was why the entire lecture Monday was devoted to Euclidean lattice field theory. Um, the second thing that I'm going to warn you about just consistently is that premature optimization is the root of all evil. If you start trying to think about solving the problem in the most optimistic way and the most optimized way before you've even written down you know, any idea of how to do it, you're going to have a bad time. You're often likely to lead yourself into trouble where you've over-optimized for the special problem you're working on and working on the general cases. And this you know, extends from everything to coming up with onsots for doing variational methods to trying to come up with the right way to digitize a gluon field and put it onto a quantum computer. So, you know, that's me coming from my sort of computer science, more of my background to say that one for you. And then the last one is that, you know, in the whole spectrum of field theory, there are many, many things one could be interested in. You could be interested in conformal field theories. You could be interested in, you know, quantum gravity. You could be interested in condensed matter systems. And me personally, my prejudice is I would like to solve QCD on a quantum computer. So most of the things that I have to say are going to be geared in that lens, but that doesn't mean that they can't be applied to whatever systems you personally might be interested in. And that's, of course, where you should raise your hand, shout at me, and ask me what I have to say about that. So with that, um, you know, again, this is coming from a different talk where I've you know, sort of focused on high energy physics because I think that's what most of the physics audience is here. Is just that sort of fundamentally, as Dorota was trying to say on Monday, high energy physics and field theory in general requires quantum computers to compute the things we want. So in the case of things that I'm interested in, you know, if I want to do neutrino astrophysics, if I want to do collider phenomenology, if I want to study finite density and strongly interacting matter at like RIC or at the EIC or at the LHC, or if I want to study neutron stars, if I want to think about quantum cosmology or even, you know, really speculatively think about non-perturbative quantum gravity, all of these problems sort of at a formal computer science level appear to require a quantum computer to solve exactly or to solve you know, reasonably well in you know, the lifetime of the universe, which might be a decent metric to put things with. And again, if you're a computer scientist, this won't be news to you. If you're a physicist, this might be news to you that there are notions of computational complexity classes and that different problems and the ability to solve them sit in you know, different spaces that can be solved at different you know, speeds in some sense or in terms of how much memory would be required to solve them. And basically anything you can do quickly on your classical computer in a deterministic way sits all the way down here in P, the so-called polynomial time. And if you wanna start solving you know, more complicated and interesting physics, oftentimes the problems we're interested in, you know, you'll be told classically they sit out here in NP, which just means non-polynomial. It means that if you want to solve with some particular algorithm that you've specified on a classical computer deterministically, it will take you a non-polynomial amount of time to solve it. So something like exponential or factorial time, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's cool about uh, classical computers is that you know these aren't the only two complexity classes you could imagine. These aren't the only two paradigms you might try and program something in. And unfortunately, the picture, the place where I stole this from, doesn't include what's maybe the most important one for a lot of us in this room, which is the so-called bounded polynomial or bounded probabilistic polynomial time, which says that if you accept some statistical error on your result then in a polynomial amount of time, you can probabilistically get the answer that you'd want. So I can get a number with some statistical error bar. I can run a Monte Carlo. 
And if there are solutions that you know sort of sit outside of P, but out here in NP or maybe you know, over here in NP hard, where a bounded probabilistic algorithm will get you the answer you want with some statistical error to it. Now, that is the entire premise behind, you know, sort of Euclidean lattice field theory from a computational science perspective, is that a lot of the interesting problems we care about sit outside of P, but they sit inside of this bounded polynomial, uh, bounded probabilistic polynomial time. Unfortunately, all of the problems I'm going to talk about today, these ones that sort of fundamentally require a quantum computer, do not sit in BPP. Instead, they either sit in BQP, which is bounded quantum polynomial time, which is if you have a quantum computer and are willing to accept some statistical errors, you can get it polynomially, or they sit out here in sort of QMA, which is a so-called quantum Merlin Arthur, which is a cute way of saying sort of the non-polynomial equivalent for a quantum computer. So, you know, before we go any further, we're talking about uh, field theories and sort of the defining quality of a field theory is it's supposed to be infinite dimensional, both sort of oftentimes in its local Hilbert space, but you know, sort of infinite dimensional in space time. And so if you want to do field theory on a quantum computer, you should immediately ask yourself, whatever problem you're thinking about, is this likely to be doable now in 10 years, or am I waiting for the exascale fault tolerant computer of the future? Like where in the scheme does my problem actually sit? And so of course, because I'm a malicious instructor, uh, I'm actually gonna ask for some feedback and some comment from you guys. So suppose I wanted to run a circuit that has 100 qubits on it, and each qubit needs to be acted on by at least one entangling gate. Can I get a 50% success rate at the end of my calculation if I told you that all of the entangling gate fidelities are 95%? I see head shaking no. Anybody think yes? Okay, why not? What? One minus P to the N is what you're going to tell me? One minus, minus, one minus P to the N? Let's start one more time. Me? One plus Okay, so this is the probability of getting it right. So in this case, this guy is actually this 95%. Uh, so this is one plus minus five to the N. Okay, does everyone agree that that's right? Okay, so first of all, what is this number? <laughs> okay. This is why it's called a gut check. Is you should try with your gut and see what you get. So, so we agree that this is the number you want. Okay, so what is N in this case? Okay, how many gates are there? 99? 99 entangling gates to get each cube at one time? If every qubit needs to be acted on by at least one entangling gate, how many gates do I actually need? 50, okay. That's what somebody said. I will accept that for now. So you're basically saying, we just pair them off into pairs and everybody sees one thing. Okay, so what is this number? Is this above 50%? Somebody says yes, so what is the number? <laughs> At least like four of you have laptops. You can surely like put this into Google and it will be not insanely unhappy with it. Yeah, that'll work for me. There we go. <laughs> Nobody's going to tell you. So it ends up being 7% if I remember correctly. But as you say, given there's a 50 here, you know, at leading order, you take 50 times 0 0.05, you're going to, you're screwed. So does everyone agree that this calculation is correct and that I shouldn't bother? Does anyone have a problem with this? Someone has a problem. Which problem? What? Uh, okay, you might be able to do error correction. Uh, that is not what I'm thinking of, but that would be a good way to get around my question about whether this would work or not. Because I only told you about sort of the physical gate fidelities potentially is the way you're gonna read that. You're gonna say, that's not actually the error corrected fidelity, that's the, the physical fidelity. Okay, 
That's cute. So this thing assumes no error correction. Did we assume anything else? What? That you need what? That they, they're indistinguishable. We couldn't tell if we'd gotten the right answer. Okay, sure. Um, I'm going to say that is a way you could have read that, but it's not one I'm thinking of. There, there, are, there are more troubling assumptions that we've made already. Yeah, no, no, but th this is the probability of getting the exactly correct answer. And then the question is, what is the distribution across all the other possible states? And your, your claim is that if that distribution is different, I might be able to learn more or less about it. Yeah. Yes, that is true. But again, that's not what I asked. What I asked was, what is the chance of that probability? And the question is, is this the right number to compare that 50% to? Someone in the chat said, Bayesian statistics go brr. Okay, so you're gonna complain about using Bayesian? Fine. That is again, you guys are getting much more deep than I'm thinking. So um, if, if I really tried to think about this 7% by itself, the one thing that we're certainly neglecting is the fact that we sort of assumed that every single entangling gate is gonna act independently. And in fact, that's not obvious. It's not obvious that they should act independently. It's not obvious they should act, you know, all making you randomly better or worse. They could all be coherently making you worse in which case this number gets even lower, but then you need some you know, better noise model as opposed to just assuming random error. It could be the case that they coherently act in such a way that you don't actually get as bad as 7%. So you know, in addition to assuming that there's no error correction, we assumed there's no correlation between the gates. Yes? Sometimes, <laughs> that is what I'll say. There, there, is, there is an even bigger assumption that you have all made here that is important. And can anyone see what another assumption might be? What? Nope. Exactly. Uh, no false positives is another guess, but no. You all, at least implicitly, or I tricked you into assuming that the only entangling gate you're allowed is a two qubit entangling gate, which is both where this 50, which is where this 50 comes from. But if what I told you was I have a machine that allows me to entangle all 100 qubits with one gate, then all of a sudden my fidelity is going to be 95%. Or yeah, it's going to be 95%, which is above 50. And now you're going to look at me and say that is somewhat absurd to say that I have an 100 you know, qubit entangling gate. But there are machines out there, both that exist today and are being developed, that talk about having three and four qubit entangling gates. In which case, you know, this n changes quite a bit because the number of gates you actually have to apply changes. The you know error profile of those types of gates and how they go wrong changes quite a bit. So you know, to say that you know just because you know this you know doesn't work out for you doesn't mean that you're you know end all can't do your calculation. It might lead you to say. Well, what I really need is to convince someone to build hardware that has a three qubit gate. And there are companies out there that do that. And therefore you can do better and do different kinds of calculations by thinking about how your hardware is going to play. But yeah, so the punchline is, you know, these are the kinds of calculations you think about the second you try and do a calculation is where in the regime of both existing hardware and types of hardware of the future can I be? And then, you know, again, you could imagine this in satire same trick where you did 99% fidelity and what you'll find is then if you took the normal assumptions you had of you know, a 1% you know, error for each of them, that they're uncorrelated and you need 50 of them, you would actually be able to hit 61%. So you know, changing your single gate fidelities by a small amount once you're getting close to you know, 100 dramatically changes the gate depth you're going to be capable of doing without failing. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, like, but a, a five times factor between 10 and 50 is not going to give you quite as big of a jump as this is. And like, again, this is the biggest thing to remember, especially when you think about doing things with current machines and the near term machines is if you want to write down an algorithm, 
where in reality should you expect to actually run this thing? And again, I sort of did the exact example of the three cubic gate where I know where you'll find out that a three cubic gate, you only need sort of 34 of them to do it. And you'll be able to get still not 50%, but you'll get you know, quite a bit above seven. So let's actually talk about field theory now. As I, I sort of suggested earlier, quantum field theories are all about infinities and how to regulate them. That is what makes them sort of uniquely different than quantum mechanics is that you'll have divergences, you'll have infinities, and you need to think about how to deal with these things, both in order to put them onto a finite quantum computer, but also because you need to you know, do all of your funny quantum field theory problems. And what I would argue is that sort of at the fundamental level, there is one physical observable value you should get that in the continuum, when all of your regulators have been removed properly, there is a physically meaningful value to some observable you care about. This could be, you know, what is the scattering cross section of proton protons go to pions, but there is some real physical value that you can get. Now, if I want to do this on a computer though, uh, this thing is going to require infinite amount of memory and infinite amount of time because it's just going to be, you know, you know infinite dimensional. So what we have to do is truncate it. And so the first obvious thing you might do is say, well, I'm gonna take what would otherwise be the infinite space time of the universe, and I'm gonna truncate it down into a little box. I'm gonna fix you know, the length of this box to be L. And all of a sudden, if I compute my quantum field theory within this box, I no longer will get the exact answer that I want, but I will get something that is either additively as I've sort of you know, cartoonishly shown here or multiplicatively differing from the answer that I care about. And I will need to somehow come up with a scheme to recover that infinite answer from this finite volume answer. And you can imagine that the trick is just to do different volumes and extrapolate. And that's of course sort of in practice what we do. But again, this is still an infinite dimensional you know, space because you know, I can infinitely divide all of the space within the box. So then the obvious thing is we go to lattice field theory where what we do is we take the box and we split it up into lattice sites. And now we're even further away from the continuum and we have this lattice spacing that we have to deal with and all of the renormalization that comes with it. And the final thing that we actually have to do in order to render these things finite for a, qu a quantum computer that we don't talk about much anymore for classical computers, but at one point was a serious concern, is the fact that at any space-time uh, location, if we're talking about a bosonic gauge theory or a bosonic scalar field theory, the actual field itself is allowed to take an infinite set of values. And therefore you need to have an infinite amount of memory just to store a single site. Now, clearly what you'll say is on a classical computer, I'm just gonna do a floating point number. I'm gonna do quadruple precision, call it a day. Now, on a quantum computer, we don't have the luxury of having that much memory at the moment, so we sort of try and avoid that. But the statement is the final piece of truncation you absolutely have to do is truncate the local Hilbert space for bosonic fields from being something infinite to something finite. And how egregious that you know, truncation has to be is entirely sort of dependent on what approximation you're willing to accept and how many resources you have to play with. So, you know, uh, on Monday, Dorota spoke you know, almost exclusively about lattice actions. And I'm gonna to continue to talk about them quite a bit, but you should be uncomfortable with that because the entire time every other lecturer who's been talking about the actual quantum computers has talked, they've spoken about Hamiltonians, which if you remember back from, you know, undergraduate quantum, there is this sort of distinction between Lagrangian mechanics and action formulation and Hamiltonian mechanics. And while they are, you know, different for, you know, most theories that people in this room, I suspect are going to be interested in, there is a way to relate the two between, relate between the two. So, you know, sort of famously, you know, when you learn about the path integral, oftentimes what you see is you start out with a transition matrix element where the Hamiltonian is sitting up there and you sort of show that it can be equivalently written into a uh, space-time and Lorenz invariant action formulation. Now, uh, as Dorota talked at the very end, there's this thing called the Wilson action, which I've dropped off the fermionic terms and I'm only showing you here the two terms that go into the gauge fields where the action is defined as a sum over all the plaquettes where the plaquettes either include a time-like link to them or are just purely spatial. And whereas Dorota, I think on Monday only showed you sort of the isotropic version where you don't discriminate between having time as a distinct variable, it's important to keep them you know, separated because when you do this you know, anisotropic formulation, it's possible to construct a transfer matrix, which some of you surely should be familiar with from sort of statistical mechanics, and then use that to derive a Hamiltonian that is equivalent to using this particular action. And this particular Hamiltonian is called the kogut suskin Hamiltonian. Um, it's important to remember though, that if you look into you know, Kreutz or anyone else who does this back in the day when people wondered about it, uh, this derivation requires an approximation in order to get to this electric field squared term here, where we've now taken you know, essentially we had everything in terms of plaquettes. Now we have something in terms of just plaquettes for the magnetic term. 
but this you know electric or you know kinetic looking term needs to be the conjugate variable to the you know the plaquette which then ends up giving you electric field squared now the approximation here is basically saying that you're very, very close to the lattice spacing being zero. So you're close to the continuum that you can make this approximation. But it's important to remember that at finite lattice spacing, this is not exactly the same as this guy. Um, it's also important because this will be a running theme in terms of doing things on quantum computers that the Kogut Susskind Hamiltonian is not the Hamiltonian of field theory. It is not the Hamiltonian of H theories, but instead is a choice of Hamiltonian. And maybe the most consequential part of it is that it has errors that go like the uh, lattice spacing squared. So as you try and make smaller and smaller lattices in order to get closer and closer to the continuum, this is how quickly your errors are going to change for you. And so when you try and make calculations, it's important you know, to, in your resource estimates, understand you know, how this scaling behavior is for your particular Hamiltonian. Question. Uh, this should be... Yes, so the, the question is, clearly what I've written here is not a uh, general statement about any dimensions. If I recall correctly, it should be four minus D. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I, yes, so sometimes people do not talk about this in terms of dimensionless variables, in which case this thing has a, like a four minus D, but I have specifically chosen the dimensionless couplings in such a way that this thing, you just have one overall scaling there. So hiding inside of this electric field and this plaquette are the right powers of A that will make it possible. Uh, I believe it's four minus D in the dimension full version, yes. Okay, so another question. So, so it turns out, yes, so, so the question is, can I, from the Kogut Susskind Hamilton, is because of this approximation that I'm suggesting to you here, is the Kogut Susskind Hamiltonian. If you go to the Kogut Susskind Hamiltonian to the Wilson action, you have to make a specific choice of approximation going backwards. Otherwise, it's possible to get other lattice actions. So, in fact, there are historical ones called like the heat kernel action that, in fact, can be derived also from Kogut Susskind if you make a different choice. Uh, it, if you take the continuum limit, they will all give you the same physics. At, at any finite lattice spacing, there is the possibility that things can differ from each other. No, no. Okay. Uh, again, because I have slides and Dorota didn't, I can sort of proselytize and say, lattice field theory has been wildly successful beyond sort of all of our imaginations. If you look back at the papers people wrote in the 70s and the 80s about what they thought lattice field theory could do, uh, they would be blown away by the kind, kinds of things that we do today. So again, the picture that Dorota sort of told you on Monday was you take the continuum action, you discretize it. And again, I'm going to be lazy and drop the fermions, but I'm sort of hiding them here in this S fermionic field for reasons that will become clear in a minute. And you take the whole lattice and you place in terms of plaquettes right here. And then, you know, again, we're working in Euclidean space, so we're not doing real-time evolution like we would normally do. We're not doing the Minkowski space we care about. And then what you're going to do is, once you've constructed some action, just using a Monte Carlo with respect to the exponential of the minus action. And point correlators in imaginary time, just the formula for any particular in-point uh, correlator you might want. So why was I cagey about it? The reason is, is sort of DeRoto suggested on money, there's many, many choices of what you can do. And they depend upon what you care about, both in terms of physics, uh, computational efficiency, and other things. So there's the nielsen niemeyer theorem, which tells you that, you know, sort of I've written it in words, but not necessarily the exact mathematical formulation of the proof. But you want to assume local action with hermeticity and translational symmetry, which all seem like pretty nice things to have for a lattice field theory. Uh, then any type of fermion you try and put down on the lattice that, it, that you want to take chiral, so you want to set its mass to be zero in the bare theory and then get back also a renormalized mass of zero, uh, is going to have doublers. You're going to have additional fields that are going to be sitting in your action when you start computing things. So it is your choice between whether you want locality, hermeticity, translational symmetry, chirality, doublers, etc. And those choices have consequences. Um, 
one thing you can do is sort of this uh, Ginsburg-Wilson equation, which introduces the idea that, well, maybe what I want is to accept that on the lattice, I won't ever have chiral fermions, but in the continuum limit, I can sort of guarantee myself that I will recover them. Maybe that's a good enough approximation for me. And in that case, what you do is you say, well, this equation here, if I had true chiral symmetry, should be zero on the right-hand side. But if I introduce you know, a construction where I say, well, it's allowed to have some lattice you know, artifact that's going to break the chiral symmetry for me, but that lattice artifact is guaranteed to be proportional to some positive power of A, then clearly as I take A to zero, this term will vanish and I'll be happy. And so this you know, equation was written down very, very early on sort of saying, here's how you can tell that you don't have chiral symmetry. Here's how you could tell, how you could sort of in principle construct one. And it was sort of a loss for quite a while until people came back and realized that this could actually be to construct for you nice fermionic actions. So um, probably the one most of you that are familiar with it for quantum computing uh, is going to be what are called staggered fermions. And so here what you do is you say, I am going to take all of these doublers and I'm going to sort of break them up into locations on the hypercube and different locations on the hypercube are going to correspond to different tastes, which is what you're going to call these doublers now. And if you combine them back in the proper way where you put minus ones in the right places between these things, you can sort of construct a block fermion out of the hypercube taste fields. And what this does for you is it will give you some amount of a lattice chiral symmetry. It will remove some of the doublers for you. It remains local. It has hermeticity. It keeps translational invariance other than, you know, within the block, it clearly cannot be. But like in terms of like the blocked fermions, it will remain translation invariant. And it turns out they're very, very cheap. So computationally, if you want to put this on a classical computer, they're amazing. And so they are one of sort of the preferred categories of, of discrete fermions or lattice fermions to use. Um, the other popular one uh, by Wilson himself just says, well, hell, if the problem is that these doublers all have the same mass as my chiral fermions, if they're all going to give me these zero modes as well, why don't I just add a specific term to the action that explicitly raises their energy? And you can do that. And what you'll do is you'll be able to make the doublers have higher energy so they sort of disappear. But what you end up giving up um, is, you know, the chirality, and it turns out you also give up multiplicative renormalization. So all of a sudden, you have a set of fermions that get additively renormalized as you change the couplings. And so this causes you all kinds of headaches. There are also four component fermions at every lattice site, so they end up being relatively expensive compared to staggered ones. Um, and then we can talk about things that are even more expensive. So we can talk about domain wall fermions, which uh, sort of implicit in all of these was the assumption that you have a four-dimensional theory. And so domain wall fermions actually solve this problem by just working in a higher dimension. So they actually work in five dimensional lattice field theory. Um, overlap fermions, uh, what they give up is the fact that you no longer have a local action. You actually have to compute something that's non-local across the entire system, but this gets rid of the doublers for you. Um, and then there are many, many others, both historically in terms of lattice field theory, what people thought about and sort of subcategories of these ones of themselves. Yes. Are, is your question, why am I worried about the doublers at all? It is, a, it, is a, it is a mathematical fact that you get them. The consequence though is, if you're trying to compute the low energy spectrum of your theory, all of a sudden there are all these other states that are weirdly unphysical, but will show up. So if you say, what is the ground state of my system? All of a sudden, my, like, so in, in four dimensions, I end up having 16 doublers. If I asked you, you know, what is the ground state of QCD in this case with these fermions, instead of having the single sort of fermion ground state there, all of a sudden you have this 16 fold degeneracy, which is going to give you weird tunneling effects and weird behavior that's unphysical and will you know, screw up all of your possible calculations you try and do. So they arise because of sort of, you know, it turns out some sort of deep you know, topology of lattice field theories but your ability to get rid of them is necessary in order to get good physics out because otherwise it will give you all sorts of weird behavior. Is that the answer you're looking for? Yeah. 
uh, if you have something to take off the map, it's over here. Um, so if you work with, you know, this sort of naive fermion action and you say, okay, well, I'm working at finite lattice spacing, what is the continuum limit of my theory? Is it QCD? And because of these doublers, it's not. Because of the universality class you want to go to has a single fermion. And if you have these doublers, you do not get that theory. You still have these 16. So you're actually simulating a fundamentally different theory. These aren't just lattice artifacts that decouple in the continuum limit. They're actually there. And so like, as Hank says, if you look at your low energy spectrum, you would get something different, right? So for example, if I think about QCD with light quarks, we have an up quark and we have a down quark. And because there's an SU2 flavor symmetry with those quarks, we get, we get pions, we get essentially three pions. But if now, instead of having up and down, I have 16 up and 16 down, I've enlarged the flavor symmetry of my theory and I won't get three pions, I'll get a lot more, like a lot, lot more. And so that's not the theory that I want. So in some sense, what the issue is with those is that they're not lattice artifacts. In some sense, your macroscopic physics is different than what you wanted. So we have to do all of these tricks of doing Wilson fermions or main wall fermions to decouple them. And your, your question about, well, can't I just ignore them? Can I maybe just project them out? You can try and do that. And it turns out that they, you can do some of the projections are actually staggered. Oh, um, oh I was, I was going to say that. So that is literally what overlap fermions does is it tries to construct a projection operator that will remove your doublers for you. Yeah. But it turns out that the only way to do that projection correctly is to do a non-local operator. Exactly. And that's why that, so that's where that one bites you is you, you get rid of all the doublers at the cost of a non-local action by trying to project them out. Super yes, there, there are ways to do supersymmetry. Sorry, this is my usual can, problem. Can doublers represent supersymmetry? No, because they're always going to be fermionic as well. And in fact, supersymmetry on the lattice is its own whole discussion that actually you, you, you might be suspicious already where we've just told you there's a huge problem with putting chiral fermions on the lattice. That should suggest to you what will turn out to be correct intuition that putting supersymmetry on the lattice is very hard and you have to work even harder than what I'm telling you here. I think there was another question. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So again, it, it, so so the question was, uh, if I have these chiral fermions done correctly, there should be anomalies. This is sort of famously what you know a bunch of things about chiral fermions happens. So again, in this theorem, when you do it properly and you specify all the specifics, one of the things you can give up is getting the correct anomalies in the continuum. And if you want to get the last equivalent of those anomalies, again, there are different types of fermions that you know you'll give up something else, but you'll get the anomaly correct up to lattice. Like you can get a lattice anomaly plus chiral fermions as well. So yeah, the anomalies come to play here as well, which is, again, the anomaly ends up being the thing that screws you over when you try and do all this other stuff, in fact. Okay, so I want to also emphasize again, because this is important for quantum computing in the future, that these are sort of categories where you've made a different choice about what thing to give up. And all of them can be improved by choosing higher order terms in your lattice action, so that you have less, you know, lattice artifacts, so that the scaling of this action in terms of lattice spacing gets better. And every one of these has a way to improve them if you want to try. Um, but I want to also tell you, because it's the quantum computing you know, summer school, um, not all of these formulations have been done in the Hamiltonian. Most of them, in fact, have not. Uh, Staggered has been done, Wilson has been done, but you know, sort of these other ones have not. And so if you're looking you know, for an interesting research project, uh, how do I formulate you know, some of these more complicated ones and the you know, improved versions of them onto a quantum computer is an interesting topic to do. Uh, can you map your chiral fermions to non-chiral Majoranas to avoid this? So mapping your chiral fermions to not or to Majorana ones is sort of what happens in the staggered picture. Again, you have to be careful with your signs, but there is a way to like interpret staggered fermions as one component Majorana fermions. So that's in fact exactly how that trick works. Okay. So to sort of tell you what has lattice QCD done for those of you who don't know. So it's been, you know, an intense trek of almost 50 years now to get to where we are today. That started with Ken Wilson, and you cannot read that, but that says uh, June 1974. 
And in the 70s, the entire question was, how do I formulate you know, QCD in and of itself? How do I formulate this non-perturbative you know, nature of it? And how do I calculate with it? And in fact, Ken Wilson, who was the first person to write down, obviously, the Wilson action, uh, didn't even want to think about it as a computational like physics tool. He thought that if you put you know, the lattice as a regulator, you could analytically solve QCD, that it was going to be as good as DIMREG, or it was going to be as good as polyvalars to do it for you analytically. Now, that turned out to not be true, as you probably can guess, but sort of the decade of the 70s was not spent so much running large scale simulations, even on the computers they had at the time, but was just understanding what exactly it means to do lattice field theory and how can we do it efficiently. And so sort of in the 80s, you know, sort of 79 was sort of the first big lattice calculation that was done. And this was like Z2 gauge theory on a three to the four lattice. So, you know, something very, very small by any standards of today. Um, but in the 80s, people started having, you know, slightly better resources, and again, you can't see this, but this is in fact sort of the, the coupling, the running of the uh, plaquette energy density as a function of the coupling constant in the Wilson action, as, and sort of going towards the continuum, which is to the right here. And so people started asking, well, how is it that I can show that this lattice approximation of QCD actually gives me back real QCD in the continuum, and understanding how that limit works. And so there were lots of interesting exploratory things about learning the thermodynamics of QCD of, well, sorry, excuse me, pure glue QCD, so just SU3 itself. And sort of in the 90s then, people spent a lot of time saying, well, hell, every calculation I do here suggests that it's wildly impractical, that I'm going to need, you know, you know, petascale classical computers to ever learn anything from classical lattice gauge theory. And so the entire sort of decade of the 90s was spent finding ways to improve algorithmic methods in terms of computational physics and in terms of reducing the lattice artifacts so that you could work at larger and larger lattice spacings and you know larger and larger uh, smaller and smaller volumes it wasn't until you know 2000s and in fact 2004 if i remember correctly that we actually even started talking seriously about having dynamical fermions included so up until this point most of the calculations being done were just using the the gluons themselves there was no you know fermion sort of moving about and it was sort of at this point where people really started getting excited about, well, this thing has true predictive power sort of across the board. And it's just a matter of we need more resources and spending time on it. Um, in you know, the 2010, so since I was in graduate school, uh, we started being able to compute things like the form factors of the proton and the pion and learning about how you know, sort of you know, non-perturbative inputs to you know, collider physics can be computed. And in fact, physics got, lattice QCD got so good that we started actually having to include corrections from QED. So if you're thinking about the hierarchy between alpha strong and alpha QED, uh, we were getting things that were, you know, of such, you know, small statistical and systematic error that you needed these like one or 1% 1 corrections from QED to be included properly. And so, you know, what is the future? Well, the future is talking about things like part-time distribution functions for like the LHC, talking about going to nuclei instead of just single baryon uh, processes. And so, you know, in that 50 years, We've been just developing this entire formalism of both understanding how to interpret theoretical uh, problems, how to improve them, how to solve them. And so, to, again, to put this into perspective, what quantum computers do, um, literally a month after uh, Ken Wilson wrote his paper about how to do lattice uh, field theory with actions, uh, Kogan and Susskind wrote a paper where they talked about the Hamiltonian formulation. And this paper right here from 1974 is where the Kogan Susskind uh, Hamiltonian comes from. So, when I tell you that this paper required 50 years of development to get us to the excitement we have today, this is where you should imagine we are sort of sitting right now in terms of doing quantum field theories on uh, quantum computers. Is it just the formalism is very young even as to what we want to do. So again, because I don't know exactly what the audience is, you know, the entire way we do these uh, classical of lattice field theory is to do it with a Monte Carlo. And so the way a Monte Carlo works for those of you who really don't know, um, once your state space becomes so big and you need to evaluate these highly multidimensional integrals, one really great way to do it is to just randomly sample from the probability distribution function. So this integrand that you're capable of computing relatively easily, and then having some sort of accept reject on top of it or having some method by which to accept this proposal or not. And this again, goes all the way back to the fifties where Metropolis, Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth, uh, Teller and Teller came up with this idea. And this is sort of the entire formulation of, you know, Monte Carlo's for physics. And the idea is, you know, again, if I have some really convoluted function that I don't know how to evaluate, and I would like to know maybe the area inside of this, what I can do is I can definitely, you know, compute the area of this box. And I can definitely put points inside the box. And it's much easier than trying to, you know, find this curve and evaluate it to just say, if a point lands inside of the red, I count it. If it lands outside, I don't. 
And then given that I know the area of the box, I take the number that are accepted within the red, divide by the total number that I put in, and that will tell me what the area of the red part is. And that is the profoundness of Monte Carlo. Now, when I say that, what I'm telling you is that it provides this practical solution to evaluating high, high dimensional integrals. So when I'm talking about a lattice QCD calculation, I'm talking about something that has 100 to the four times 10 uh, different integrals you need to compute. And every one of them is potentially a real number. So this is a wildly high dimensional integral. And it turns out that with, you know, a thousand configurations on that thing, you're capable of computing physics, which is pretty wild because you wouldn't have necessarily expected that from such a high dimensional integral. So again, because I don't know what the audience is and I need to sort of lead you into a different problem. Suppose I gave you the Hank bag instead of the MIT bag model. And I asked you, what is the blueness of this bag? So what fraction of this bag is blue? What? One third, brilliant. <laughs> Except it's not. <laughs> it's, uh, it's two sevens. <laughs> but be ready. <laughs> so, you know, one way you can do it is you just count them. Um, but if you wanted to do a Monte Carlo, you might say, well, for whatever reason, this bag is very difficult to count the seven objects in it, which it turns out it is a little bit difficult. <laughs> um, so what you might do is you say, well, the observable I care about is the blueness. So I'm just going to start sampling from the probability. So I'm gonna just pull a ball out of the bag and say, is the, ba is the ball blue? If yes, and I'm gonna put a, you know, a, a one in the blue counter. And if it's not, I'm gonna put a zero. And so, this is formally the correct answer. If I integrated over the entire bag, I would get the true answer. This is equivalent to saying if I took approximations where I only do a finite number of samples from the bag, where I pull with replacement, then I will get something that approximates the amount of blueness in the bag. And in this case, you know, every one of these balls has the same probability of being pulled. So I can sort of just put a one on the bottom and a one on the top. And you would do the calculation that you just did, which says how many balls are in the bag, how many of them are blue. Now, if I did a Monte Carlo though, instead of counting just the seven, I'm just gonna start drawing them. And as I draw them, I only add ones to the numerator when I get a blue one, and otherwise I just keep going. And in the infinite limit, I will eventually get two sevenths. And that's great. Um, there's in fact also a computable uncertainty. So I in fact know as, a, as I add more and more samples, how quickly this number is going to shrink. And it should shrink like the square root of N. But what would happen if for some reason the probability of pulling a ball was not restricted to you know, zero to one? So what would happen if the thing that I wanted to ascribe and call a probability doesn't have the one property that you know, sort of probabilities need, which is to be between zero and one? And what you should be imagining is, well, if I'm talking about lattice field theory, what happens if this action uh, or if the exponential of the action is no longer real or if it has a negative probability, if it's possible to be negative? So again, here is a different bag. So now I have all of the same balls, but I've now included one ball, which is an anti-red. So its, its behavior is basically to cancel out the existence of another red ball in Hank's bag model. So what is the probability, or what is the blueness of this bag? Yes. <laughs> so you would do the exact same calculation. So you know, if you can just count them, you just say, well, this one cancels this one. So I have two blue and four reds, so two over six. So the idea that sort of is the most common one to try and the simplest one to try when I have a Monte Carlo, when the things that I would like to ascribe probabilities to do not have a probability to them, there's some quasi probability at best, is to just say, well, what if I just took the norm? I'm just gonna say, instead of saying that this thing is allowed to have probability of negative one or of you know, I, I'm just gonna say it's, it's gonna be given by the, you know, the norm. And then I will take that relative sign or the complex phase that goes into it and I'm just gonna chuck that into the observable itself and deal with it later. So basically when I draw the thing, I count it as if you know, I had probability one, and there's this extra re uh, weighting that I have to include. So you know, instead of having the original probability, all of a sudden you have norms everywhere. And then the sigma is supposed to absorb anything else that's not a pure you know, number between zero and one. And so instead of having, uh, what's the difference to QM probability amplitudes? Uh, very good question. So in fact, this is, going to be in like a couple slides, the entire crux of the problem of doing real time uh, quantum field theory with Monte Carlo. And it's in fact, sort of lucky for us that we can treat Euclidean path integrals as a statistical mechanics problem, right? Because in statistical mechanics, we are allowed to just describe everything, some probability to it. And so it, this is one of these reasons why we care about Euclidean field theory is that it allows you to talk about things in sort of a statistical mechanics and a thermodynamic language where everything does have the right probability to it. So, 
quantum mechanics itself has cares about probability amplitudes, but it turns out that when you tr do this wick rotation and all this other funny business, you can treat everything in the Euclidean field theory as if you had just probabilities instead of the amplitudes themselves, which is also the reason why you cannot use them to do certain things, is that you basically have given up on all of this sort of, you know, interference constructively and deconstructively that makes quantum mechanics sort of unique and different than just regular stat mech. So, you know, if you do this and you try to continue the Monte Carlo, you start pulling and it goes the same until you hit that, you know, anti-red ball. And then all of a sudden, you know, because the anti-red was supposed to have probability minus one, you drop from having a one-fifth to a one-fourth. But you can just do that and then you just keep going. And at some point you will eventually, you know, converge to the right number of a third. Now it will take you a little bit longer because every once in a while, whereas, you know, this thing is gonna, you know, be constantly increasing in your denominator, every once in a while it's gonna decrease. And so in the case of Hank's bag model, this is fine. But, but what happens if those cancellations were really, really strong? What would happen if instead of having just one anti-red, I had five anti-reds, five reds, and two blues? Then all of a sudden, actually establishing how much blueness is in this bag would be very complicated. And this is essentially what is called a sign problem in classical lattice field theory and in sort of Monte Carlo's, is that you know, when you do stochastic sampling, there ends up being some precise cancellations required between positive and negative contributions of things that you wanted to call probabilities, but really aren't. And generically, this thing is going to be exponentially bad in either the, pro the uh, particle number, if you're thinking about sort of quantum mechanical problems, or in the volume, if you're thinking about a quantum field theory. And so again, one really simple example you can try and think about is, suppose I gave you this integral and told you, you cannot do the one thing you want to do, which is use a pencil and paper and easily evaluate it. Because otherwise, you know, it's obvious to you that this must be zero. But if I sort of start, set up a Markov chain and sort of started trying to do a random walk through this space, if you started out in the wrong place over here, then for a very, very long time, you would think the volume is something wildly, wildly positive. And it's only once you actually started transitioning over to the other side where you realize, oh, no, 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 no. It's like not converging at all. It's all of a sudden blowing up in the complete opposite direction. And it's only when you sort of get this entire space evenly distributed between the two ever so precisely that you get the right answer. And so this you know, problem is what sort of hampers anything when you do not have real probabilities to ascribe to your Monte Carlo. So I can finally come all the way back to how does this show up in high energy physics? How does this show up in lattice field theory? So as we talked about, the way to get an observable is I have the integral over you know, the action, which can have some imaginary part and some real part, and then the observable itself. And just in the same way that we did reweighting, you might try and do the reweighting where you split this off into a calculation of the expectation value of O times that imaginary phase that can come up, and then divide by this so-called you know, sine, which is what you know, the other term here is. And if you have no imaginary part of your action, if everything is purely real, then the exponential of it will be purely you know, positive and you can just rescale it so that it's gonna be fine. You have no sign problem, the denominator is one, you get something that looks nice, and you know, everything's a positive and you can integrate this easily. If on the other hand, you do not have uh, zero imaginary part, if there's some component of your action that is negative or that is imaginary, then all of a sudden this sign is gonna be less than one and you're gonna see some integral that looks like this. And you see that you know, if I want to tell what is the actual total integral of this, I'm gonna to have to very finely cancel points like this with points like this. And in fact, because I'm you know, silly, these two integrals in fact have the same value but I would challenge you to have guessed that if I hadn't told you. And that's the entire problem of like sign problems is that like something highly oscillatory needs you to sample it very, very finely in order to know that you've gotten all the cancellations done correctly. And I wouldn't be telling you this if it wasn't relevant for you know, quantum field theory. And the fact of the matter is if you do finite density, so if you wanna do something with a chemical potential where you start trying to study you know, nuclear physics or neutron star equations of state, uh, you'll have at least some component of your action that is imaginary. You might have a real part, the real part might dominate, but you will have some amount you have to deal with. But if you want to do real-time evolution, if you want to do Minkowski physics, formally, there is no real part of your action. Everything is imaginary. And so it's sort of the maximally bad sort of sign problem. So your Monte Carlo will entirely struggle. And as sort of the question in the chat was sort of, you know, stated succinctly, the entire problem is that quantum field theory and quantum mechanics are complex valued probability amplitudes. And that that is the thing that carries the real physical content of the theory. And there are some things that are sort of somewhat insensitive to that, provided you do like Euclidean field theory. But at its fundamental level, there are going to be problems that are going to fail for you because it really does care about this complex uh, probability amplitude. So what do I gain with a quantum computer? Well, in fact, you know, Feynman, 
sort of put it sort of pithily, it's that a quantum computer does real-time evolution for you. A quantum computer is just a quantum mechanical system that you can evolve with a Hamiltonian. So it's nothing more clever than saying, well, instead of trying to force a classical computer to tell me something about quantum, I'm just gonna make quantum tell me about quantum itself. So again, the things you've all seen a million times at this point, you go from bits to qubits, you get a block sphere. And quantum computers can efficiently represent, you know, entanglement and superpositions, which are sort of these big properties of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory that you don't have in classical mechanics. What that doesn't do for you instantaneously though, is give you a field theory. And so a lot of what I do in my day to day is actually finding ways to map quantum field theories onto quantum computers, because this mapping, both from a theoretical point of view and efficiency point of view uh, is highly non-trivial. So what are the problems that I actually try and solve? And of course, there's a puzzle. And the puzzle is sort of these interlocked pieces that a decision you make in one can have dramatic consequences later. And so sort of as you do a research project where you try and develop an entire method to do quantum field theories on quantum computers, you should always be thinking about how, you know, the screw up you make over here, while it seems innocuous, can screw you over later. And so the very first thing that sort of everyone, you know, writes a paper about and thinks about is encoding. How am I going to take the fields, the fermions and the bosons of whatever quantum field theory I care about and map them onto the, you know, quantum computer that I have, either a qubit or a qubit based machine, how am I going to take those fields and represent them as registers in this machine? Once you do that, maybe the hardest question is, well, okay, I can now put down an arbitrary state in the quantum computer, but how do I find the states? How do I set up the states that I care about? How do I put a proton onto a quantum computer as opposed to just a random collection of gluons and quarks? Once you do that, you know, there's, you know, the interesting question that if you care about time evolution, so if all you care about is finding ground state physics, so you're talking about a condensed matter person often, a lot of them care more about ground state physics. This initialization of its on its own is a huge problem. This is why you've had a lot of talks about finding ground states using VQE, using other methods like that. If you want to do time evolution, you then need to figure out a way of mapping the Hamiltonian that's then exponentiated onto the gates that you have available to you. And then sort of finally, something that might seem trivial but doesn't end up actually being is, you know, how do you actually compute an observable you care about? And sort of the really, really simplest concern you should have is, well, the entire premise of lattice gauge theories is that I compute endpoint correlators. But on a quantum computer, I only get to act once with a Hermitian operator, where I sort of perform the measurement using a Hermitian operator. And so at that point, you know, everyone will say something where they wave their hands and say the words collapse the wave function. But the point is you sort of can only put down one Hermitian operator without doing a lot of extra legwork. And if all you can do is one operator, that really limits the scope in terms of what observables you can ask questions about. So you have to be more clever, even about asking questions of what questions can I ask? <laughs> and then finally, because we live in the NISC era, but even going beyond it, you know, you need to either mitigate or perform error correction. And, you know, in some sense, we could just be lazy and say, I'm going to take all the error mitigation strategies and all the error correction that other people have, and I'm just going to apply those. Or you can realize that lattice field theory, like any other problem, has special properties to it, which in fact, you can get more bang for your buck by optimizing the error mitigation and correction strategies towards the problem you care about. Because it turns out that lattice field theory can be slightly more robust to some types of errors over others. And so if you're thinking about something in terms of like the fault tolerant error, you'd say, oh, okay, instead of needing to correct every single bit flip error, every single phase error, every single possible error that can happen with these incredibly expensive error correcting codes, maybe I can tolerate, you know, telling bit flips to go away. These are things that, you know, can happen. <laughs> so fermions on a quantum computer. Most computers, uh, it should be somewhat obvious to you, are built from bosonic degrees of freedom. Hooray, that's great. I'm going to use spins. I'm going to use, you know, photons, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, this is going to cause a problem. Does anyone know what the problem is? What? Right. But what, what, what is the distinction between bosons and fermions that's going to cause me a problem? What? That's right. The anti-commute. So that they fundamentally have a different quantum mechanical behavior. And this might seem, again, depending on how much you think about it, either something trivial and innocuous to say, ah, fine, I just need to build my fermions out of bosons somehow. Uh, that will turn out to be a massive headache. <laughs> and in fact, is a big piece of you know, work that you have to do. So it gets even worse. It's not just that like single fermions, so the single little quarks that I'm gonna put on my sites on my lattice have to be, you know, have anti-commutation relations. It's that if you want to prepare a fermionic state on a quantum computer, it needs to be fully anti-symmetric where you trade any of the uh, fermions all the way around. 
And what this leads you is then to prepare fermionic states on bosonic systems, you get highly non-trivial mappings between the fermionic state you want and the way that the bosons have to be arranged and they have to interact with each other. Um, so there are you know, a few common things that certainly some of you have heard of at this point, um, but there are others that have, you know, again, algorithm special properties and you know, particular problems where they're trying to solve them specifically. Um, but you know, sort of the earliest one, which allegedly you know, was come about in sort of the 30s or the 20s, I forget which exactly, is what's called Jordan Wigner. And what you do is you say, well, the problem is that if I put down a fermion operator, I need to make sure that it's anti-symmetrized with every single fermion that came before it. And so if I just imagined a single chain of fermions, I could start at the left and just say, I'm, if I want to correct the jth fermion and I want to you know, excite a fermion at that site, all I really need to do is just sort of pass along from the beginning to the end of the chain from the left to, to the location of J, making sure that I hit it with you know, a Z. And so I just do a tensor product of all those Zs collectively with one single excitation operator right where I want it. And this works amazingly. It's efficient in 1D. And in fact, the Hamiltonians that you write with fermions in 1D, uh, you basically can almost always get rid of this entire Z factor here because it'll be contracted with some anti-fermion somewhere to make sure you have a Hermitian operator. Uh, but the second you go to higher dimensions, you need to do some kind of ordering because you need this, this sort of relies upon you saying, well, I know where the beginning of my chain is and I know where the end is. And so, you know, the example in 2D is all of a sudden, instead of sort of just going from the left to the right, you have to go from the left to the right of the top line. You have to weave yourself back and weave yourself back and weave yourself back and weave yourself back. So this becomes really, really expensive. And it requires a huge number of gates to ensure that anytime you try and mess with a single fermion, you've kept the whole state anti-symmetric. So uh, Ravi Kataev sort of went one step further and said, well, this is a little bit egregious. You don't quite need to be that careful because you sort of know, you know, the first ones get flipped a certain way, the second ones get flipped a certain different way. So there's some notion of the parity that's going to happen. And I can use this fact that parity is going to be uh, treated in a particular way to go from obviously needing order, you know, J gates, and I don't know why I've chosen a different letter, but to something that only requires log M or log J gates in this case. So it, it still requires you to do some of this chaining operations. So it's still expensive, but it, you know, you've gotten, someone would say an exponential improvement. Um, these two work pretty much in general. Whatever type of fermion problem, whether condensed matter or high energy physics, they will be okay. They will be expensive, but they will be okay. Um, there are some more advanced, complicated methods of trying to encode fermions, um, but these end up being application limited. And in particular, because I am a high energy physicist, one really interesting example is if all you have is a fermionic theory, if you're, again, you can think about lots of condensed matter systems that are purely fermions, like the Hubbard model. There are lots of really cute optimizations you can do above either of these two that will get down your gate count and get down all of the complexities in terms of scalings by quite a large amount. But the second you actually have to couple those fermions to a bosonic degree of freedom, in particular, if there's like bosons sitting at the links between these things, uh, a lot of those methods blow up and get you back to these bad scalings. And so it's a complicated question of, you know, which applications can you use better methods? Which ones are we just stuck with this? And can we do other things with fermions? Um, and then the sort of the last thing that sort of is really interesting that people have talked about recently is, well, why don't I just design a machine either from the ground up as a fermion machine so that I have a quantum computer that acts on fermionic states, or in the process of going from physical qubits to logical qubits, I'm actually going to encode a logical fermion as sort of, you know, the fundamental data type that I have in my error corrected computer. And so there's a little bit of work talking about how to do this. And if you're looking for an interesting research project, I can guarantee you that how you mix and match quantum error correction with making logical fermions is, is a great thing that both condensed matter and high energy people would care about a lot. Okay. What? So the, the statement is that Zohar and collaborators showed in 2009 that anything that has a Z2 embedding, you can completely move, remove the fermions out of your theory. Yeah. So there are theories that I care about that don't have Z2 as a very nice embedding. Oh, okay. Okay. There are also the cases where you can do this, it is expensive and it costs you other things. There are trade-offs to that formulation. Like any formulation screws you somewhere. That's just the way the world works. So yes, if you wanna get rid of your fermionic degrees of freedom, there are ways of both locally removing it and non-locally removing it, which Zohar has done a lot of work on both of them, but there are weasel worded trade-offs that you have to make in other places. So yes, it is, it is true that you can remove your fermions completely sometimes, 
But whether that is the optimal approach that you want to go with, it's not always clear. Because in particular, there are non-local encodings that are really terrifying to me about you know, connectivity of gates and things. But yes, there again, there that that is in fact some of the things I'm thinking about where the application is limited in choices, is that there are lots of ways to do this, including just straight up getting rid of fermions from your theory. Okay, so I, in fact, personally have not spent a lot of time thinking about fermions because so many other people have, and the condensed matter people spend a lot of time thinking about that. So what I've spent a lot of time is thinking about how to digitize the gluons because they have a completely different problem. And, you know, there's in fact sort of like a little like letter that was written for the snow mass process for high energy physics, which doesn't mean anything to anyone, where we sort of tried to enumerate all of the possible discussions of ways to digitize bosons that have been talked about. And as I sort of said, there are lots of choices that are some combination of you have a particular Hamiltonian, you choose a particular basis to write them in, and you truncate them in some particular way. And in particular, this truncation is the thing you should worry about the most, because unlike the fermions, where you either have a fermion or not, this is you know the whole fermion statistics and poly exclusion principle, Bosonic fields are allowed to have arbitrarily, arbitrarily high amplitude. So in principle, they are an infinite dimensional Hilbert space at every single link on your lattice. And so you need to truncate that somehow to make it finite to put on a computer. Um, I am going to focus today for what time I have on discrete subgroups as an approximation because I know the most about it and it's a lot easier to talk crap on your own methods as opposed to other people's without getting into trouble. Um, but the things that one asks oneself when we talk about quantum computing is, you know, what are the qualities that would make a good scheme? What are sort of the things I should be thinking about as the desirable properties? Whoa, what button did I push? Okay. So the first one is the obvious one. You know, what are the quantum resources that such a truncation is going to require in order to get me to the physical point where I can remove the finite volume effects, where I can remove the, the finite lattice spacing, where I can, you know, get to the chiral limit if that's what I care about. You know, what are the resources to get me there that are going to be required? Because different methods will have different scalings. Um, again, there's a truncation. So you should be worried that you're going to lose some symmetries while you digitize. And getting those symmetries back in the continuum and back when you get to the physical point is the entire game that you care about, is that knowing when you try and get there, you've recovered whatever things you've got rid of. And then personally, I think, can the scheme be simulated classically? So there are ways you could imagine of treating bosons where you make all of them into fermionic fields. So there, there, are these, uh, there are methods called fermionization. And these could work in terms of being a very useful and an efficient encoding on a quantum computer. Uh, the problem though is you cannot simulate that classically. So the only way you will know the first two questions uh, in some extent is to have a big enough quantum computer to test them on. And so you're sort of chicken and egging yourself where you're waiting for the machine to be big enough for you to learn about how good your truncation is. Whereas other schemes either can be attacked classically or analytically by hand. So before I talk specifically about discrete groups, let's again sort of just talk about the general thing. So one way you could go about digitizing is say, I'm gonna start from the Kogut-Suskin Hamiltonian, which is again, a particular lattice regularized version of the true continuum Hamiltonian I care about. Um, what you should notice, you know, sort of trivially, is that there's two obvious bases you could choose. You could choose to work in something where the electric field is diagonal, or you could work where the magnetic field is diagonal. Um, lots of people choose the electric field because the electric field is just an E squared, whereas this is, you know, the trace of the product of four different links where each link is its own independent degree of freedom. So, you know, what you could do is take the electric field basis, and then what you do is say, I'm going to take all the electric fields up to a certain amplitude. And the important thing, again, to remember is that once you've done this, once you've made your choice of basis and you truncate, you are no longer actually using this original Kogut Suskin you wrote down here, because this thing in principle has an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. What you're really doing is some approximation of it where you have the normal thing plus some new operator that has who knows what behavior, depending on what truncation you've chosen. So what can this thing do? Well, it can break symmetries. If you're really wild, you can break unitarity entirety. Um, if you're used to quantum field theory language, it could end up being a relevant operator in and of itself. So in fact, as you try and take the lattice spacing to zero, this could become the dominant term in your Hamiltonian. And in the same way that these two terms, because you implement them onto the quantum computer as a set of gates, this thing is sort of secretly going to be hiding in there. And the types of noise that the quantum computer gives you is going to affect how badly your choice of truncation then makes it you know, a bigger mess for you. I reiterate, this is not a triviality. This is probably the biggest choice you can make. <laughs> this defines the EFT you're going to be computing with on the quantum computer. What that, this defines how your qubits are going to scale as a function of the lattice spacing you work with. The continuum theory that you are trying to get to could be lost. You could end up going to a completely different theory 
and then you're going to be computing a bunch of things that don't have any relevance to you. Uh, this breaking, because you've introduced you know, a symmetry breaking operator will start mixing matrix elements when you start doing non perturbative renormalization. And all of a sudden, the thing that you think corresponds to one field uh, correlator could be a completely different thing. Um, it is, in fact, also not necessarily obtained just by taking the replacement of U by whatever basis you've chosen. Because when you start doing non perturbative field theory, in fact, what this thing will be is whatever lowest dimensional operator has the same symmetry breaking as the one that you've included, because you'll generate all of those lower dimensional operators too. So this is not a triviality. <laughs> so how does discrete groups do it? So the, the one thing I will claim is that sort of, to my mind, discrete groups sort of allow this plug and play behavior where for the moment when I'm in some qubit limited regime, they are going to be relatively efficient. And in the future, most of my algorithms can be designed agnostic to the fact that underlying them is a discrete subgroup approximation. And that that's sort of nice. So what I do is I literally say, well, I have some continuous group G that is going to represent my bosonic degrees of freedom. I'm going to just replace it everywhere, either in the action or the Hamiltonian, by some discrete subgroup of it. And I've now rendered something that was infinite, finite. Hooray. And then the, sort of the obvious example is you take the sphere and you replace it by a bunch of points. And my joke for the mathematicians in the room is that I don't actually need the full closure of the group to get the physics I want. And for the case of SU3, so if I want to do quantum uh, field theory for QCD, uh, this reduces like sort of the largest subgroup is what's called the Valentiner group. It's also called S1080. It's also called Sigma 360 cross three that to different mathematicians, they wanted to emphasize different things, either their own name or other things. But the point is that if you imagine representing this by some double precision set of numbers, uh, you're going to have, you know, two orders of magnitude, fewer qubits if you just accept doing the finite subgroup. And again, as I sort of said about this plug and play idea, I secretly believe that in the same way that lattice cubes started out as using discrete subgroups themselves because classical memory was expensive, that someday we will have large enough quantum computers to replace whatever other constructions we have by the standard three by three double precision matrices. So again, for those of you not up to speed on discrete subgroups and discrete groups, um, the idea is, you know, again, if I have more qubits and I have better computers, I can do bigger groups. And sort of there are, you know, the ZN groups form sort of an infinite tower that approximates U1 of QED. Uh, if you want to, if you're interested in U2 instead, there are these so-called binary uh, groups and uh, binary dihedral groups and dihedral groups and binary dihedral groups. Uh, if you care about SU2, then there's the sort of the platonic solid, the double covers of the platonic solids. And if you care about SU3, there turns out to be, you know, only three groups that are sort of really useful because they have sort of crystal-like behavior. And the nice thing again about doing this construction of discrete groups is you can sort of imagine building up sort of primitive gate operators that act on group structure that then you, you know, get, and then you build up to doing Hamiltonian time evolution. And then you build up to doing, you know, an entire plaquette being evolved together. And then someday we're doing, you know, exciting physics. So once I have chosen this finite group, there are a lot of ways, again, you could encode it onto the, the qubits that you have. And sort of the natural way to do it is just to say, well, every element of the group can be assigned an integer. And then I'm just going to encode this integer uh, onto the qubits as the bit string of those integer, of whatever integer it represents. So for example, if I told you that I have the 23rd element of the group, I would represent this perhaps as 23. Can somebody tell me what the, the qubit representation of that's supposed to be? Anyone remember how to do binary to decimal conversions? Really thought there were more computer scientists in the room. <laughs> was this what was being mumbled? Okay. So, okay, so I just told you, you know, this is how I might do it if I had qubits. Again, uh, but again, I work for SQMS, so I have to come talk to you about actually the machines we're building. And this includes these so-called qubit based machines, where instead of just having zeros and ones as your computational basis, we can have zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 blah. Are SK design like HAR approximations for groups? Not SU2. Yes, there are in fact, there's, there's a whole literature about doing HAR approximations instead of doing the discrete groups where you give up the gauge symmetry of the discrete subgroup in order to get a, a finer mesh on top of these things. 
Um, and that, that's sort of the word you might Google in literature, sort of like mesh encodings of gauge theories. So, you know, what might these registers actually look like? So, you know, sort of the trivial thing you might imagine is, well, I have a QDIT that has enough states in it that I could represent the entire group. So if I cared about S1080, which happens to have 10,080 elements, um, I would need one qubit that's capable of supporting 1,080 states. And then all I would do is I would just make my little lattice and I would connect them all and I'd be happy. But of course, you should be immediately concerned about how I'm going to have 10, 000, or 1,000 states just in one quantum register. So you know, perhaps the more realistic thing to think about, certainly in the near term, is having multi qubits per register. And in this case, I've sort of taken the Rigetti architecture of these, the Aspens and the M1s, and what I've done is I've color-coded them so that if you see a color that's beside itself, these three qubits together would represent one register for what is called, uh, you know, something that has eight elements or fewer. So all of a sudden, instead of having this nice lattice that maps directly onto the lattice of quantum field theory, I have this complicated interaction between three qubits that has to be interpolated, as well as all of these sets of three around them. Going in the other direction, uh, the other part, so this, you know, is an SQMS machine that's being worked on. The other idea is to do sort of this 3D cavity architecture that will be talked about, I think, this afternoon, where you actually have so many modes in your cavities that you can actually support multiple registers in one single qubit. So this would be, again, in the case of like S1080, if I had 10,000 states in a single qubit, I could put down 10 of these links all together in one qubit, and then I put 10 in this one and 10 in this one, and then, you know, the entire way that this algorithm gets written differs between these three particular architectures. So what is the problem with discrete groups? So, you know, it should somewhat be obvious to you that it's called discrete. And if we want the continuum, that might cause a problem. And that's in fact what happens. So if I tried to take, this is sort of the phase diagram of U1 gauge theory coupled to a Higgs, where this Higgs is put into, whoops, sorry, um, some particular representation of U1. And so I have, you know, the coupling that goes in front of the gauge fields, and then I have this coupling between the gauge fields and the scalars. And it turns out, you know, if I just ran around this line from zero to infinity, I would be doing uh, pure U1 gauge theory. So you would find that on the lattice with the Wilson action, it has some confining phase and it has some Coulomb phase. And given that it's the word Coulomb for Coulomb's law, in fact, if you're out here in this blue regime, all of a sudden you're doing things at a fixed lattice spacing, but in such a way that you could extrapolate to the continuum that sits over here at beta equals zero. Now, if all of a sudden you start cranking up kappa, you start interact, introducing this interaction between the scalar and the gauge fields, all of a sudden you get pushed up towards this axis. And it's, in fact, it turns out that this axis in this particular diagram is where Z2 gauge theory sits. So if you wanted to approximate U1 by Z2, this is what happens. And the immediate problem you should see is that there's actually no Coulomb phase at all. It is completely dominated by the Higgs phase or the Higgs phase or this confining phase. So nowhere in this diagram for the Z2 are you analytically connected to the regime you want, which is the continuum limit of U1. On the other hand, if you start getting a larger and larger group, you could imagine that all of a sudden this Coulomb phase needs to come back. And in fact, it turns out at Z6, this you know, previous non-existent phase in the discrete group opens up for a little bit. And so you have some amount of regime where you're analytically connected to the continuum limit, and you can sort of do physics that will approximate it, provided you don't try and push too far in trying to shrink your lattice spacing. And again, if you're a high energy physicist, you know, the way you can see what the discrete group action actually looks like to all orders is to integrate out your Higgs field, and you'll be left with some effective action that is going to include a whole bunch of irreducible representations, either of your discrete group or your continuous group. So the way you should think about discrete groups, if you are a you know, perturbative field theorist, is as some continuous group coupled to a Higgs with a particular type of VEV. Um, and that you start by coupling, and the particular representation that the Higgs is put into determines how you break from your larger group to your smaller group. And so you can imagine if you put this Higgs field into a representation where it is the a representation of both the discrete group and the continuous group, and it's the largest one, then you will break to that discrete group instead of breaking all the way down to the bottom, the way you know, the canonical Higgs does. You could probably imagine that as I go to higher representations, so you know, a larger and larger subgroup relative to the infinite group, uh, I will be able to get to smaller lattice spacings, which means that this Higgs phase gets pushed further and further towards infinity. 
And you know, if you dislike this approximation of you know, using discrete groups because you're going to have this obvious Higgs phase, uh, note that this you know, lattice spacing artifact here is very similar to the fact that when I do a lattice calculation, I will recover rotational symmetry, so you know, SO4, for the low-lying state. So if I start asking about very, very IR physics on a lattice calculation, I will see rotational symmetry restored. But if I start querying about high energy states, so something really, really close to lattice cutoff, all of a sudden I will see that there's no lattice spacing or that there's no rotational symmetry and that it's all dominated by the fact that you're on a lattice. And it's a similar picture here that if you ask about IR physics and you can make this uh, discretization error sufficiently large or push it to the sufficiently high in the UV, then you ought to be able to get the same IR physics out. And you know, I told you this nice picture. This picture was worked out a long time ago for Higgs's coupling to U1. It turns out again, because non-abelian gauge theories have complicated irreducible representations that understanding how the Higgs couples to non-abelian G's and breaks to non-abelian subgroups is, is hard and complicated and people are working on it. So how can I predict what this freezing transition is? Yes, question. Yes. Well, yeah. Yes. So the, the question was, uh, if I do regular Higgs breaking, I'm supposed to be left with some continuous symmetry or I break it completely, in which case I generate a bunch of Goldstone modes that are supposed to be, you know, the low energy excitations. Those are continuous variables still. What the hell happens if I do a discrete breaking in this case? You get something that looks like a discrete Goldstone mode, which is exactly as weird as you think. It's going to have sort of topological behavior to it. And in fact, what this phase hiding out here is, is secretly a topological phase of, Q, of whatever gauge theory you're talking about. There was a question in the chat about, uh, can there be domain walls, i.e. cosmic strings in the model if one introduces the Higgs? Yes. So as many people who are more familiar with cosmology are well aware, when you start trying to take continuous symmetries and break them to discrete symmetries, you almost always end up with domain walls. So you will have cosmological effects like that in this theory. If you thought that, you know, some discrete group was really the way that the universe acted. So there are ways of, you know, maybe learning something about the non-perturbative QCD uh, cosmic strings, if that was something you really wanted to know by doing this, but it's, you know, not at all obvious that when you do cosmology, you would want to suggest the Higgs breaks in some of these sort of super contrived ways. Yes. Yes, I, I will agree that I, I have, yes. So the, the question, well, it was more of a comment. Uh, my, 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 sta my statement that if you dislike the fact that I'm doing this, you should remember that SO4 is similar in this way. And the statement is, yeah, if I do um, SO4, sure, the IR physics isn't capable of probing the UV and I can sort of show you empirically or like literally using the, that all of this uh, rotational symmetry breaking effects are, of higher order in A, and therefore they're suppressed into the UV. There's a similar argument that can be made here. It is equally complicated. And it's sort of, again, it relies on the fact that you are, again, in this analytically connected regime with the continuum limit, and that you're not ever going into, going across the first order boundary into the Higgs phase. Yes. So I just told you that basically this entire argument hinges upon you having a small enough uh, a freezing lattice spacing is what we call this. Uh, so is there any way to predict that or do I have to do a lot of work? So again, in U1, the picture is very clear. You sort of have a circle, you want to discretize it. And as you discretize it more and more, uh, you know, what happens in the continuum limit is you get small and small infinitesimal fluctuations sort of around the identity and it's, you know, gauge invariant partners. So what you should imagine is that in the discrete group, what happens is you want to sort of, at, you know, very, very, you know, strong coupling, you should be sampling across the entire circle. And, you know, if you have a dense enough thing, the entire circle you know, discreetly, it looks like the, con the entire circle. But as I go to lower and lower, uh, or go towards the continuum limit, I get fewer and fewer oscillations away from sort of the bottom of the circle, in which case all of a sudden I see less and less elements. And at some point, instead of seeing, you know, that I can always jump up to this, you know, nearest neighbors, 
all of a sudden the only element I can get to that isn't exponentially suppressed is going to be the identity itself. And so there's no ability to get sort of infinitesimal deformations from the identity. And so you've basically failed to have gauge theory at that point. So in that picture, clearly somehow the nearest neighbors in your discrete group must be telling you something about how well you can do. And in fact, you can work this out because U1 is amazing. And what you find out is that the freezing beta, so if you took the Wilson action and asked what for a Z in group is going to be the value where I freeze out at, you can just compute it from geometric arguments and you find that it scales like N squared. And people have shown that you can extend this to SUN groups where you find that the number of elements in the group uh, raised to a power that depends on what group you're in. So you can compute what this beta is. And you know, whereas the ends can sort of be taken to infinity, so you can always get arbitrarily close for U1, uh, there's only a limited number of finite groups that you can put into a non-abelian theory. But again, this isn't necessarily all tragic. Because what you should remember is in the case of SUN groups for asymptotically free theories, the relationship between beta and the lattice spacing is one of you know, an exponential nature. So if you can get you know, just a little bit further in beta, then you're getting exponentially further in terms of how small the lattice spacing you can work at. So you know, this is the heuristic argument. You can also do a long bunch of numerics to determine exactly what alpha or AF is. So the very important question is, there is this notion in lattice field theory that uh, DeRota didn't get to talk about, and I really will not have time to say much about, that when you're in the scaling regime, which is to say, when your errors of the lattice calculation are polynomial in the lattice spacing as opposed to exponential themselves, uh, you're able to extrapolate to the continuum limit reliably and get you know, interesting physics in the continuum, which is a theory we care about. So really our goal is not so much to get, alpha, or get AF to be as close to zero as possible. That's you know, overkill potentially. All we really need to do is insist that we have a sufficient hierarchy that we can get into the scaling regime and that AF is sufficiently smaller than whatever lattice spacing we want to work at that we can ignore this effect. So what do we know from the Wilson action? Well, I just told you, you know, for U1, you can sort of go arbitrarily high, provided you do you know, N above four, you're probably okay for doing you know, discrete group approximations and extrapolating to the continuum limit. For SU2, um, there are three subgroups that are interesting to us, the binary tetrahedral, the binary, bi the binary octahedral, and the binary icosahedral. And the two larger ones are sufficiently far into the scaling regime with their freezings that you should be okay. For SU3, it turns out literally every group fails with the Wilson action. And the best one uh, only gets you to about four, whereas the scaling regime needed you to get to about six. And so for that, you know, thousand qubits of SU3, I could have done, you know, a four cubed lattice of this SU3 subgroup, the Valentiner, which again is also called Sigma 1080. And here's the dramatic graph showing you that over here, after you get this like kink is where the scaling regime happens and we're nowhere near it. And so you might say, well, we should just quit. Um, but again, this is a huge difference in qubits. And maybe we should think a little bit harder before we give up completely. So I've sort of subtly hinted across the entire rest of the talk. Why the hell should we even use the Wilson action? Why are we using the Kogut Susskind Hamiltonian? Maybe there are better things that will avoid this issue and will solve all of my problems for me. And in fact, we know historically that the Wilson action is, in, is inadequate for many of the things we want to do in classical computation. And sort of the story goes that the Wilson action, if you write it out, is really f mu nu, f mu nu, plus a term that goes like a squared. And so one way to deal with this lattice artifact is to do what's called semantic improvement, which is where you literally add new terms to your lattice action to try and cancel off higher order lattice spacing effects. And one way to do it, to do it is you add two extra terms, one of them, which then becomes the rectangle of six links, and then one of them, which is the parallelogram, which has also has six links. And if you choose beta, beta two and beta three properly, you can completely cancel off these a squareds and you'll just be left with an action that scales like a to the four. So if you're willing to accept a little bit of extra computational cost, all of a sudden your scaling goes from a squared to a to the four and you can work on some much coarser lattice. Now, the problem with this that you might worry about is that you know, the rectangle and the parallelogram all of a sudden need six links instead of just the four. So I've introduced some slightly larger non-local behavior to my action. Uh, it turns out, that you can also, instead of doing semantic improvement, just add other irreducible representations of the group. So instead of just doing the so-called fundamental, you can add the adjoint representation and you just get a free coupling and then you tune these two together. What? Uh, 
So the parallelogram, in fact, sort of like snakes its way around the edge of the cube. Yes, it's not really a geometrical one. It's it's a it's the thing that looks slightly like it if you you know rotate it in the right direction. So the argument is again, all actions agree in the continuum. All actions disagree on the lattice. But there is a sense in which the same physics, in the sense that you will be working at the same lattice spacing, happens if you tune the Wilson lattice coupling and you tune whatever other ones you have. And so you know these sort of diagonal lines that are sort of hard to see. I suspect are supposed to be if you do a perturbative calculation where everywhere along that line, you're essentially doing the exact same physics regardless of which couplings you've chosen. So the idea then would be, well, if I do these modified actions, maybe I can get away with lower truncations. So I bring you back this picture that we had before where there was this closed regime up at the top and I've colored it specifically. And in the case of Z4, so not Z2 as we talked about, but Z4, previously it also did not have any opening into the Coulomb regime. But if you add in this extra term, which is the adjoint term, and you look at the entire phase diagram and those two couplings, then what you get is that you still have this green confining regime, you still have the Higgs regime, but instead of just having the red and the green, if you take a diagonal across this, you can enter into the sliver of the Coulomb phase. So instead of doing you know, Z5 and being able to do it with the Wilson action, or the Wilson action you can do Z4 and save yourself you know, one half bit, uh, by just doing a little bit of extra computation. And while you know, the difference between Z4 and Z5 isn't that dramatic, um, you could ask, well, is this enough to help S1080? And of course, I wouldn't say it if it wasn't going to. And so what you do is you need to find the phase diagram. So in this regime is where the Higgs is hiding. Over here is somewhere where the confining phase happens. And the question is, along this trajectory, can we get into the scaling regime phase? Now, Something that's relevant for quantum computers, but also for classical computers, is this idea of state prep. If you want to compute the observable physical properties of some state, you need a way of preparing that state. And unfortunately, I don't know what a glue ball looks like. I don't know what the proton actually looks like in terms of quark and gluon fields. So instead, what we do is we construct correlators, which are sort of, again, in this case, two point functions of all the possible operators that we know on the lattice that have overlap with the state we want. So all of the operators that have the right quantum numbers for the state we want, and then we sort of diagonalize after doing all the possible cross correlators between them. And that will give us the cleanest signal we possibly can and will give us what's called an interpolating operator that will give us you know, some sensible approximation of the field we care about. So in the case of what I'm about to show you, in order to do this, there were 10,000 plus independent operators just in the zero momentum sector across the 20 possible symmetry sectors uh, of my lattice to compute glue balls um, when I did particular types of smearing on them. And this is just you know, sort of a schematic little piece of what some of them look like. And in conclusion, uh, this gray point here and this blue line are what you get from SU3. Uh, and so you sort of should extrapolate both of those to the zero lattice spacing limit and you see that they don't even agree with each other. And then this red line, is in fact just doing an S1080 calculation. And sort of as I promised you, uh, these two do not agree at any finite lattice spacing, but they all three sort of appear to converge together in the, the continuum limit. So the argument is that if I use some modified action, I can do well enough with S1080 to not have to use the full SU3 and save myself a bunch of qubits. We did you know, other uh, glue balls as well, you can check. And this seems to all reproduce all these things at 10 times higher energy than we had previously known. And so what it seems to be is you say, well, if all I care about is the finite volume effects and the lattice spacing effects, these observables suggest that you know, an S1080 uh, approximation of uh, SU3 is going to be good enough at least until you're talking about machines that have more than 10 to the five qubits. Yes. Yes, there is an understanding why this curve is flat. And that understanding is here. Again, what you have is something where you're taking a bunch of terms and you're trying to cancel off relative you know, A squared terms. And it turns out that if you choose these things correctly, this thing either goes away completely or the actual numerical prefactor to it shrinks. And so it happens to be that people had shown with SU3 itself that when you do these modified actions, you get better lattice spacing effects. No, no, no. So, so this, this line is not consistent with A to the four scaling, but it is consistent with reduced A squared, which is what you were expecting from doing these you know, modified actions. 
if you had chosen a sufficiently modified action, you could, you should in principle be able to completely cancel it. But this one and then the other, so this one is, is the most egregiously flat one. The other two ones you see a bit more curvature in terms of A squared. But you, you would, should have expected that it was better than the unimproved Wilson action. Whoops, now I've completely gone off the rail. Oh, cool. Okay. So I'm supposed to end. So I'm going to end by saying, so I just spent a whole lot of time talking about just how to put gluons onto a quantum computer. What would an actual algorithm look like? So, you know, Jordan Lee and Preskill wrote a paper a long time ago, which includes all of the things you guys have been hearing about. I'm going to have to do some kind of vacuum prep, vacuum prep that I'm then going to adiabatically evolve some type of state on top of to get to the state that I care about. So if I wanted to collide two protons, I would need to adiabatically evolve sort of six free quarks until I had two protons. And then once I have the state that I care about, I time evolve it with either trotterization or something else and then perform a measurement. Again, you can sort of do this naive scaling and ask yourself how many qubits do you need? And it's you know, an enormous number. And if you try and figure out the circuit depth, you'll figure out pretty quickly that you almost certainly need logical qubits to do this. Um, really quickly, I guess, what is trotterization? Trotterization or any approximation of you, the time evolution operator you wanna do is going to introduce new operators into your Hamiltonian. So you should imagine any approximation of you that you do is some form of renormalization of the Hamiltonian you care about that will introduce new operators and you need to understand what they are. Because as you take, in the case of trotterization, it's the time step. As you take that step larger and larger, you deviate further and further from the actual line you care about. And what it does is it in fact causes eigenstates to mix at uh, non-zero lattice spacing. So this entire curve can just be understood as the uh, exact eigenstates mixing with each other under the behavior of these new terms you've introduced into your Hamiltonian. And what this strongly suggests is that something like quantum smearing, the way that we do classical smearing for lattice gate series is going to be important. Um, UV states are probably gonna be a problem. If you think about doing 3D field theory, so three spatial dimensions in one time, you should know that your density of states in fact grows with energy. And what this means is that on a lattice calculation, most of the states that exist are lattice artifacts. So if you start having contamination of excited states into your simulation, uh, it's going to get worse and worse and worse as you try and go from you know, the one dimensional theories we do today to the big theories. So this is one more thing. So how do you build these particular two operators? How do you build the kinetic and the potential term that are gonna go into your trotterization or into your you know, variation algorithm? So if you're doing a gauge theory, all you really need to do is once you've specified how your registers are built, either with discrete groups or some other approximation, you need to specify how to invert those gauge elements, how to multiply them together, how to take a trace of them and how to perform a Fourier transform. And if you specify those sort of four fundamental building blocks, this is what your kinetic term looks like for the kogut suskin Hamiltonian. And this is what your potential term looks like. So you can imagine optimizing these two things for your architecture while learning independently about how different groups should be optimized. Uh, we did this for these DN groups. We ran them on Rigetti. And what we found was that you can get something like 80% fidelity for these four primitive gates, but the doubly controlled phase gate was critical to getting this high behavior. So the entire reason at the very beginning that I made a whole stink about three qubit gates, it's because they are very helpful. Um, Kogut Suskin, as I rambled, is also not the only Hamiltonian. There are improved Hamiltonians. And these things, depending on what lattice spacing you work at, give you, you know, huge factors of savings, you know, a factor of an order of magnitude without costing you more gates when it's all said and done. You can also build them. Uh, can you compute it today? Mm, not really, your fidelities are pretty weak. Is a CC not the same as a Toffoli? Um, I believe the doubly controlled X gate is the Toffoli, yes, but that is not the same as the CC phase gate. Uh, I was very ambitious. I already told you that though, so that's fine. Uh, if you want to compute observables, you'd better know how to write them down in terms of your lattice Hamiltonian. So that's hard and scary. Uh, there are nice scalings you can figure out. And I will just skip more bad life stories that I've learned about. Lots of things. Yeah, maybe we'll just end with this. So as of right now, today, if you really want a great research project, even though I gave you a bunch of other little ones, Today, the best estimate for doing QCD is something like 10 to the eight logical qubits and 10 to the 55 T gates. And this thing you know, could take a little bit less than three years of runtime on an exascale quantum supercomputer. 
And that should indicate to you just how far away we are from doing it. But it makes a whole bunch of assumptions. It assumes that you're going to do a huge lattice that as we've talked about, choosing other observables you know, can take fewer qubits. They use the Kogut-Suskin Hamiltonian. We've already talked about other Hamiltonians being better. They choose a particularly egregious truncation for QCD, which takes something like 24 qubits, whereas most people who have written papers about SU3 find that somewhere between like five and you know, 11 is gonna be a, you know, a properly reasonable amount. Uh, they take trotterization with a really loose air bound and all the other methods that you've learned about from Sohabe and uh, I forget who else was talking about that, uh, can maybe help you. And they're very platform dependent in terms of where this estimate comes from. And so choosing different pieces here or choosing all of them completely differently could bring this down. And in fact, it must be brought down because if you want to you know, destroy humanity or help humanity by learning of cool quantum chemistry, these things are only estimated to take something like 10 to the seven logical or 10 to the seven physical qubits and 10 to the 20. Oh yeah, this needs to come down if we wanna be in the realm of practicalness and convincing the hardware people that are definitely gonna try and you know, work for the NSA or work for Pfizer to you know, help us as well. And with that, uh, I will quit <laughs> and say thank you and I'll take whatever questions you have left. <laughs> In your toolbox that you were describing uh, of what you need, like you need the adiabatic preparation, trot revolution, digital, or eventually quantum uh, analog evolution, wouldn't you say that you need also pre-selection, post-selection tools for enforcing the symmetries, the gauge symmetry specifically? Because even if you have an evolution toolbox that is supposed to protect all the gauge symmetries when it's not committing an error, errors will eventually disrupt your gauge symmetries. And so you may go towards unphysical spaces. Wouldn't you say that you need also that tool? Um, would I say that? Um, my weaselly answer would be, I wouldn't say necessarily. Hmm. So there, there's a bunch of great work that's come out of um, several different groups about showing that gauge violations, so, Backing up, the obvious biggest thing that one at you know, first order would, might worry about is gauge symmetry, is the fact that noise very likely is gonna screw up gauge symmetry. There've been a lot of papers written showing a semi-robustness to you know, reasonable mo noise models that break your gauge symmetries. And that for, you know, depending on how long you actually have to run your simulation, that actual unphysical walk that it takes might not cause you, you know, catastrophic failure instantaneously, that you can tolerate just violating it for a sufficient amount of time relative to the time you might wanna compute your operator on. So it's not obvious that you need it. Now it's uncomfortable and we have to be careful of checking it because, and okay, so I say that because the operators you're trying to compute themselves had better be gauge invariant. And it turns out that these unphysical pieces of like, if you're doing an, if whatever state you compute a gauge invariant operator on has some gauge dependence in it, there are ways of after the fact sort of just analytically removing it. So that's one possibility where you just basically say, I'm gonna let this thing be as noisy as it ends up being. I know I can tolerate this amount and then I can chuck a bunch of it away and get the correction. Do I think that's the right answer? Probably not. I think you do need to deal with this in some way because for one, you definitely want, if you're not going to do I'm only going to work in a Hilbert space of the gauge invariant states instead of this you know, broader one that I'm talking about potentially. In that case, you need to do a lot of classical pre-processing in order to get you just the basis of gauge invariant states. But then you're safe from gauge symmetry Although it's an open question where that, if that's gonna make it worse for you in terms of breaking other symmetry with the noise. So that's where I will say there is that it's not clear that that's the right trade-off either. But yes, the noise comes in, it's going to screw you up and knowing what parts of it you can tolerate, which parts you can't, as I hopefully have convinced you through the whole thing is the entire racket here is understanding which ones we can and can't for the near future. So it's, it's not something to like be completely willy and nilly about, but it's not obvious that it, some of them can't be tolerated in the, the air budget that we need without actually implementing something to fix them. <laughs>